So, my name is Cassidy Cousins, and I am a certified interventionist, despite outward appearances. It's Saturday, May 11, 2013. And I was trained in intervention by a gentleman named Ed Storty. And what I'm going to do today is sort of talk with you about how you can have a conversation with someone that you know, a loved one, an employee, an employer, that is struggling with addiction, mental health issues, an eating disorder, sexual addiction, any number of problems related to some sort of addictive pathology. So this could be a gambler, this could be an overeater, this could be someone who's a chronic alcoholic. And more often than not, people view the process of intervention prior to doing an intervention as a confrontation. And what's important to realize is that it's really not. It's not a confrontation. There is going to be an element of feeling that comes up in the process that feels confrontational, certainly for the person that's afflicted. But the reality is that what you're trying to do is just present information. So remove the idea of confrontation, replace it with presentation. And I'm going to take you through some simple steps. So the first one talks about identifying your emotional state in relationship to the person that you're going to be intervening on. And the reason that that's important is because if you don't fully understand where you're coming from, then when you go into the intervention, if you're severely angry, if you're desperate and afraid, then what happens is, is it sort of frames itself in the process of presenting this information and it comes across, you know, consciously and subconsciously. So one of the things that you have to do prior to an intervention is you have to really understand what your emotional state is. And, and the reason for that is pretty simple. So if, if you're angry, the important thing to realize is that you can't be angry about something you don't care about. So if, if you go to Starbucks and, or Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf or whatever your local coffee shop is and you, you come across a stranger and the stranger says something to you that's rude or you open the door for someone and they don't acknowledge it, usually you won't get implicitly angry. You might have something come up and sort of dissipate quickly but it won't be the level of anger that you'll experience in certain situations with someone you're emotionally connected to. And the reason for that is because it's impossible to be truly angry about things you don't care about. So at any point in time that you're really angry with an alcoholic, an addict, a gambler, someone who's been through treatment multiple times for eating disorders or sexual addiction and consistently and chronically relapses, or breaks their cycle of abstinence, what's important to recognize is that what is underneath the surface of that anger for you is a great deal of care. And the reason that that's important to identify prior to doing an intervention is you want to operate from that place of, of concern and care. If you go into the intervention angry or prepared for a fight, you're going to get a fight. And if you go into the intervention aggressive, you're going to get aggressive back. So if you can narrow this down to the root core experience that you're having, that anger is care, that fear is usually pain or a combination of fear and pain, and that knowledge will allow you to then present this information from a deeper place to them. Okay, so that's really what number one is about. You have to identify your emotional state in relationship to the person that you're going to be having this conversation with. The next thing is pretty clear. It says create a personal intention to have the conversation. And the reason for that is because, you know, what sounds good on Saturday, May 11, 2013, and what happens Sunday, May 12, 2013, can be two totally different things. And in order to maintain a commitment to having this conversation, this presentation of, inter of information, you have to be committed to the process. And here's what I can tell you, 100% without a doubt, addiction is treatable. So the truth is, is that unlike other diseases, if you want to refer to it that way, 
this condition is 100% treatable. In other words, it can be put in complete remission and then with maintenance completely removed. So it's unlike other medical conditions where you don't know if the treatment is going to work. If someone follows their treatment recommendations, and this isn't a plug for ARC, if someone follows their treatment recommendations and the recommendations are clinically based in diagnosis and an individualized treatment plan, and that person follows those recommendations, they will be able to engage a process of recovery and ultimately healing for whatever psychiatric or psychological issues are co-occurring. So at the end of the day, maintaining an intention is about taking the hopelessness and the despair out of it for the afflicted. If they could do any better, they would. All right. So the person who's suffering from addiction or depression or anxiety and masking those symptoms with medications or alcohol or other drugs knew another way they would take it. And if they knew how to consistently apply other techniques, they would apply that. But the anesthetizer that alcohol, drugs, or addictive behaviors represent anesthetizes feelings that are underneath the surface and allows them to function, albeit not effectively, but allows them to survive. So you, you'll hear a lot in, a, in like 12-step meetings or rational recovery meetings or smart meetings or like any sort of group-based process around recovery that people say addiction saved their life. And, and a lot of times what they're referring to is that they were in so much inner turmoil and, and so much pain that anesthetizing themselves with these substances or these behaviors or these rituals, such as with eating disorders, allowed them to be okay enough to not pull a trigger, <laughs> literally. So the, the, the truth is that if you can address those underlying factors, there's hope for the individual. Now, the process of getting the individual to accept those recommendations is a long process and it's different for every person. But for you, you have to have an intention that is fundamentally grounded in the treatability of these conditions. And it doesn't matter whether the person that you love has been through treatment before. It doesn't matter whether they have not been to treatment before. It doesn't matter whether they're hopeless or it doesn't matter whether they say they think they can do it, but they never do. The reality is, is that if they follow recommendations, if they get proper diagnosis and they subsequently comply with the treatment plan, they can eradicate these conditions. So the third, you know, or the second is actually just about you knowing that. So create an intention to have this conversation that is based on the fundamental idea that this person can get well. Uh, number three is investigate your treatment options. So this is important. Um, I mean, how should I frame this? The reality is, is that you have, you have two basic approaches in the United States for addiction and co-occurring disorders treatment. On the one side, you have traditional treatment, which is behavioral modification based. And on the other side, you have clinical treatment, sometimes referred to as an evidence-based model. And the truth is, is that neither is perfect and neither is necessarily better or worse than the other. But typically, if you, if you have the resources, insurance, private payment, or some sort of charitable organization that might act on this person, the afflicted's behalf, a combination of behavioral and clinically based treatment is advisable because Addiction does have behavioral issues at its core. So there's, there's patterns of behavior that result in essentially what we call addictive pathology. So when someone's entrenched in those pathologies, you kind of have to move a muscle to change a thought. In other words, if I'm using alcohol every day or I'm binging and purging every day and that's become my ritual, Really, treatment is a lot about, in the beginning phase anyway, creating the safety and the structure and the containment to be able to break that habit. 
And as you know, or as you've probably heard, like 21 days, 28 days to break a habit. That's what the nicotine cessation programs used to sort of scientifically reference that it took about 21 to 20, 28 days to consistently doing something to break a habit. So that's really kind of how 30 day treatment centers started. There was an idea that if you went to treatment and you interrupted these patterns of behavior, that you would be able to uh, eradicate certain habits and replace them with new habits. Uh, the truth is, is I disagree with that. I think that, you know, and, and I don't mean to diminish the idea of 30 day treatment. I think it's wonderful. But if, if you really conceptually acknowledge the origins of addiction or addictions or substance abuse or self-destructive behaviors related to some sort of addictive pathology, what you'll see is that there's an entrenched component around these responses that is predating any pattern of self-destructive behavior or any pattern of consumption. In other words, most people use as a method to self-medicate or anesthetize. So what are they self-medicating? What are they anesthetizing? You can break the pattern in, in 30 days, but the clinical investigation, the diagnostic procedures, the evaluation psychiatrically and medically and neurochemically and blah, 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 that's necessary to diagnose the individual and understand what's going on underneath the surface takes a little more time. Part of that is because you know, substances by their very nature interrupt belief processes, thought processes, neurochemical processes, physiological processes. So when someone is a substance abuser or in certain cases like a gambling addict or in other cases, um, you know, even eating disorders, they're interrupting physiological neurochemical elements that take a little while to reorganize themselves. And they will reorganize themselves. I mean, there's a point in time when you can do damage to the extent that this is somewhat unfixable in certain elements, certain areas. Um, but the reality is that, you know, truthfully, the body will kind of move itself in a direction, the brain will sort of move itself in a direction the emotional makeup of a person will modify itself to a basic state of reorganization or a template, so to speak, just naturally if you abstain. So if someone stops doing self-destructive things, the truth is, is aspects of their life is gonna, are, are going to change. Um, the unfortunate part is that the addiction is so obsessive and so compulsive and so sort of neurochemically integrated into the picture that without a lot of support, a lot of people can't abstain. That's what treatment's about. That's what treatment is for, to help people understand how not to drink and use, how not to act out, how not to engage in these self-destructive behaviors that are bringing them relief, neurochemically, emotionally, you know, physically, but ultimately destroying the organism them, themselves. So, Behavioral clinical, it's important to have an integration of those two philosophies. Um, I think the best programs ultimately will have an integration of those two philosophies. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be 12 step based and evidence based because those are two totally separate constructs. In other words, you know, meeting uh, programs that take you to a lot of meetings are not necessarily doing that because there's evidence that says that's the most successful direction that you can go. Conversely, evidence-based treatment would say that methadone is a success. In other words, if an opiate addict stops copying drugs on the street and committing crimes to obtain illicit heroin and goes to a methadone clinic daily and crimes go down and they're going to a specific place every day and there's consistency in that, evidence-based treatment says that's a success. So between those two places is this what's called integrated model of treatment. And an integrated model of treatment, sometimes they call it holistic. Just so you know, I think that's kind of weird. Holistic is not so much an, an, an integrated model of treatment these days really as it is massages and yoga and acupuncture and all these sort of spa-like components, which just so you know, if that's what you want to do for your loved one, my suggestion would be to get them a, a, a month at the Four Seasons because 
As far as treating the addiction and the underpinnings of the addictive pathology, massage has no real place in recovery. Yoga doesn't prove itself to be so efficient in treating the dis-ease. Um, they're adjuncts that are helpful to just like rejuvenation and health, but the clinical template, the emotional template, and the physical template is not even dented by a spa. So if you know your loved one wants to go to a spa, I really would, I would just send them to a spa and let them have the experience of that not working to eradicate their condition so that they can come to a conclusion that they need to do some actual clinical, medical, psychiatric, psychological treatment, some integrated treatment. Um, so the short of it is that you have to investigate your options and you, you have to decide whether you want a behaviorally based program, a clinically based program slash evidence based program or an integrated program. I'm a believer in the integrated model. The truth is that I'm extremely biased over the last 12 years. I've seen that technique work most efficiently. It's basically individualized treatment. Um, it's a big like flag term in the treatment field. When people tell you, when you call these centers and they say, we're an individualized program, if they treat 30 people, they're not. It's just that simple. The reality is that individualized treatment means this. It means that your loved one will go to a program and they will be individually treated. If they have needs in this area, they'll get those needs met. If they have needs in this area, they'll get those needs met. If they have both those needs, they'll get both those needs met. And ultimately, the fundamental foundation of individualized treatment is going to be the number of individual sessions that the person does while they're in a program. So individual sessions, psychiatric sessions, psychological evaluations, medical evaluations, that individualized component uh, is what really assures you that a program is individualized. So. When you're investigating your drug treatment center options or addiction treatment center options or alcohol rehabs, whatever it is that you're actually looking for, what you want to do is ask them questions. If you're interested in an integrated model of care, how do you differentiate treatment for each individual? And be conscientious. I mean, it, some people are just going to say, oh, we do it. And it's like, great. Okay, so what do you do? And what you want to hear is you want to hear five individual sessions plus per week. You want to hear full psychiatric workup, evaluation, and diagnosis. You want to hear full psychological evaluation and diagnosis. These are two totally different things. If you have questions about that, just call me and I'll explain the differences because it would be too complex right now. But ask them what you do. Show me what the individual treatment is. And Otherwise, just know most programs fundamentally at their core are behaviorally modification based, meaning nine times out of 10, when you call a program, it's going to be fundamentally rooted in the 12 step construct, which is fine. I'm not disagreeing with that, but it's going to be fundamentally rooted in the 12 step construct and it's going to be group oriented. That's nine out of 10 programs in the United States. If you're interested in the evidence based side, you, you just have to be conscientious that they're not going to prescribe medications that are habit forming in the long term. Uh, I think that that would be a diminishment of the power and capability of the recovery process. You don't want someone to be essentially um, chemically restrained is what we call it. When someone's given a medication that eases compulsion and craving because they're high, you know, essentially they're on another drug, but it's prescribed. I mean, that's not going to really change any of these other elements, these underlying elements, and allow them to live healthier and more free and more comfortable in their own skin. Um, if you're interested in the integrated model, you really got to investigate it and ask the right questions. Um, so then you're moving towards the intervention. The, the key to that point is that now you basically know why you're intervening. You're going to intervene for sure. You've got an intention to do it. You know where you're going to send your loved one. This has all been chosen. You know where you're going to send them. And the next step is to actually have this conversation. And the key to that is to remain calm. And just so you know, you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> okay, it's going to be impossible to be calm, all right? But you can represent yourself 
as being there because you love the person, you're scared, you're concerned. And as hard as it is for you to do this, you're willing to walk through their frustration with you because you love them and you, and you want them to be well. That's the kind of calm that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the calm that comes from a place of authenticity. That this is not about a result. You can't walk into an intervention demanding that someone do something, just so you know. The minute you do that and you make it black and white, this is without a professional. A professional might be able to make it black and white, but if you're going to have this conversation and you're going to do it as a family or a friend or a loved one or, like I said, anybody in relationship to this, the truth is, is that your leverage points are going to be different because you don't have an outside professional that's there that represents like the seriousness of purpose. You know, the whole point of having a professional involved in the intervention is that it totally changes the dynamics. I mean, this is, you know, they did a study in the 70s and they basically looked at college students, I think it was at Stanford, but they, they took a bunch of college students and they put them uh, in, a, in a hospital room. And they had, uh, you know, a guy with a white jacket who wasn't a doctor, but looked like a doctor, was dressed like a doctor, go into the room and they monitored the students' heart rates. And what they found was about 50-50. 50% 50 of the people were calmed by the presence of the doctor, and 50% of the people were activated and nervous in the presence of the doctor. Ultimately, that's what a professional intervention does. A professional intervention provokes one of those two responses. It's either going to be a calming effect, or it's going to be a provocative effect. Both are good, by the way. If someone is provoked, they're provoked into a state of awareness. When the doctor walked into the room and the college student saw the person in the white jacket and they were provoked, they listened intently. That's part of why you have a professional intervention. It provokes that intensity to listen and to hear, right? On the other side, if a professional interventionist comes in and they're calm, uh, the, the person is calmed by that, that's also good. So you're not going to have that. You're doing a, a family intervention or you're looking at doing a family intervention or an intervention that doesn't have a professional. I'm guiding you through that process. The key for you is to go in there calm. And the key to calmness is authenticity. So that way that I communicated that shed your fear, shed your insecurity by telling your truth. And you've already done the work. You've already looked at why you're there. You're not, you don't hate this person. You care about them deeply. You're connected to that place. And you're going to have this conversation with them from that place. That's an authentic experience. When the heart speaks, the heart listens. So it's very hard, no matter how sick, no matter how much an amphetamine psychosis this person is, if you go in there like this, where you tell your truth gently, that's the kind of calm that we're looking for. In terms of other people that are involved, you have to, you're going to be responsible and you have to identify the emotional state of your loved ones or the people that are around this. So I'm expecting that you would not try to do this alone. I mean, just for the sake of transparency. The, the reality is, is that there's a reason that professional interventions in the Johnson model, in the Storty model, in the Invite model, in all of these different models, one of the things that's consistent is they bring a group to intervene, for the most part. Some are like satellite fringe intervention styles, but most will bring a group to intervene. That is really about overweighing ego. So what you're doing is you're, you're representing yourself with solidarity. This group of people is coming in, the cycle of secrecy has been broken, and you're saying to someone, the jig is up, we know this is going on, and we want you to get help. We love you and we want you to get help. So you have to identify the other players that are going to be involved on this you know, chessboard to make sure that no one's going to run in there and break up the good work that you're going to be doing. Because you're going in there knowing what your intention is, you know where you're going to send the person, you know you're not mad, you know you just love them and you care, and you don't want, you know, 
Mr. Smith, his old high school coach, going in there and saying, hey, brighten up, you stupid little bleep. You need to go to treatment because it totally is going to disrupt this message that you're trying to send. So number seven says identify the emotional state of the players. If someone is not able to connect with the care and concern and they're, they're insistent on staying angry and they want to go in there and shame this person, just know this person is already ashamed. This person is already scared. This person is living in despair. The key is a candle of hope that there's a path and you don't even know what's on the path, but it has hope all around it. And if you go in there and you slam them and you put them into some sort of submission hold emotionally and spiritually, you're strangling the last part of them. And don't get me wrong, that might be a last resort. I don't want to say that it is or it isn't. I don't believe in it and I don't want to do it. And the reason that I don't do it is because I don't want to, if something tragic happens, have the last thing that I said be me. And I've done hundreds of interventions. And just so you know, some of the people that I've intervened on are not nice. They're not nice. They're totally toxic. They're poisoned. You got family members, grandparents, kids even, crying begging the person to stop using and they act terrible just it's disgusting just so you know to see the disease the dis-ease unwilling to shift it's disgusting and I don't want to tell them that they're a piece of garbage I'm not gonna walk out have that person suicide or drink themselves to death over the course of the next five years and know that the last thing that I said to them wasn't kind. So if you, that's a personal choice. You gotta make that decision yourself. Now I will tell you this, there is a way to communicate seriousness. And so I have said things, for example, let's say there's someone who says they absolutely won't go to treatment. They're rude during the intervention, they're angry, they're volatile, they're lashing out, they're cursing. Interestingly enough, they're sitting and staying for it, right? So they're lavishing the attention on one level, but then making this histrionic display of how frustrated and disgusted they are with everybody that's in the room. It's an interesting thing, right? They, you'd think if they really had that core value set, they'd just leave, but they actually like the attention. So what I've said is... I just want you to know, let's say it's Mr. Smith that I'm intervening on. I just want you to know, Mr. Smith, that number one, this isn't the way that it has to go. And number two, I can guarantee you, based on what's happened here today, that things are going to change. I don't know how they're going to change, but I do know that things are going to change. Maybe Mr. Smith says, what the F do you mean? And I would say, your family, your loved ones, your friends that are here, spent a lot of time and energy to come and present this information to you today. And quite frankly, you've been very disparaging. So I don't know that they're going to be interested in continuing to extend the olive branch. They might let you have your own experience, but I do know that things will probably change. So it's direct, it's kind, I'm telling them, you know, we're not going to come here and be thrown at. You know, we're not going to get mud in our eyes again and again and again and again. If you want to die from drinking, you'll die from drinking. If you want to continue to throw up after every meal until you're hospitalized, you'll continue to do that. If you want to try to mortgage, you know, somebody else's house to pay your gambling debts, you can go ahead and try. But it's not going to be in our line of sight, right? So you got to identify the emotional state of the people around you. Um, if they're not going to be consistent with what your theme and your message is, my advice is to not include them in the process and to have a conversation with them about not having a conversation with the person you're going to intervene on. So this, we're going to talk about the secrecy in a second, but unfortunately you're going to have to go about this kind of like a secret, a secret agent. So if you come into the intervention, if, if say I'm being intervened on and you're intervening on me, if you call me, 
the day before and say, I'm going to come over and do an intervention on you tomorrow, then I'm going to do one of two things. I'm not going to be there, <laughs> number, number one. Or number two, I'm going to have a list of things to argue about. And I'm going to manipulate every angle that I possibly can to prevent you from being right and enforcing that I address my addiction. So you got to be somewhat secret agent about it. You got to go into it not telling the person that you're going to have the conversation with. This is just one philosophy. There's another philosophy that's an invite model, but I'll go into that at a later date because you've probably already tried to get this person into treatment. And in some senses, that is an invite model of intervention. So you've already kind of gone through the process of having the conversations with them. They've said no, and now you're having to do this sort of major thing. Um, really, you know, what it comes down to is that the surprise is what sometimes tips the tables in your favor. So the, the person's on the fence. The afflicted, the addicted, they're on the fence. They're not um, saying that they're going to go to treatment. They're saying that they don't know what to do. And you don't know at the point of intervention what they're ultimately going to say. But if you go in there and surprise them, sometimes you can break the foundation enough that they fall on the side of giving it a try. Whereas most of the time, if you warn them that the intervention is coming, they'll just be prepared to continue to use and argue with you. So the next thing talks about denial. And you know what I want you to be aware of is that 9.99999 times out of 10, you're going to go do this intervention <clears throat> And it's not going to result in someone saying, I'll go to treatment right now. Usually there's a little bit of a discussion at least. And if there's not a discussion, there'll be an argument. And the truth is that, you know, for you to expect that this person is just going to say, all right, I'll go is unrealistic. So be prepared that they're going to deny that a problem exists. And I'll give you a couple little tips here. You don't have to have evidence. You don't actually have to have solid evidence about what a person is using, abusing, or doing specifically. What you can actually talk about, and this directly counterbalances and counteracts denial, is concern. If you come from a place of concern, something like this. There was a point in time when I remembered you smiling a lot more. And you're saying this to the afflicted. There was a point in time that I remember you smiling a lot more. It seems like the last few years, that smile has gone away. And it saddened me to know that you're not living in the way that I remember you living so joyously and free. And I think that there's a place that can help. So what that does when you approach like this general idea that there seems to be unhappiness, hopelessness, and despair at the core of their being, which there is, you're not talking about specific substances because you know you don't want to get into a debate about whether alcohol is good or bad. You know, you don't want to get into a debate about whether benzodiazepines, Xanax, Klonopin, things like that are good or bad. What you don't even want to get into a debate about how much they're using. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you intuitively know that there's a problem. You intuitively know that that problem is related to substance abuse or an addictive behavior. And you intuitively know that there's help out there. But if you try to draw the line in the sand at the point of intervention that they have a substance, a substance abuse problem, that they have an eating disorder issue, but you don't have the evidence, the actual tangible evidence, then that denial will win the day, usually. Because you don't have any truth that you can say. You'll end up on two opposite sides where on one side you're saying there's a problem, and on the other side they're saying prove it. So you don't want to have to prove anything. You want to recollect from your own experience the deterioration that seems to have taken place in their life. That counterbalances and counteracts denial. So when you go to actually have the conversation with them, again, replace the idea of confrontation with presentation. When you go to actually have this conversation with them, what you want to say is, coming from a place of first person. I am concerned. Not your effing up. I love you and miss you. Not you never come around. 
if you keep everything in the first person, you're not setting up the stage for this head-on collision. It's going to happen. You're going to have a head-on collision with the addiction. You're having to do an intervention, for goodness sakes. So you're going to have a collision. Don't create the conflict. Don't go in there saying, you, 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 because you're just pointing fingers. And again, they're ashamed. They're embarrassed. They're hopeless. They're fearful. They're angry. They're not attaching to the fact that they love and care about you. They're on all this other negative side of feeling. So... If you go in there saying, you, 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 you create a confrontation and it just closes down the ears. Like they won't be able to hear what's happening. They won't be able to hear you saying, I love you. I want you to get well. Um, gotta, gotta operate in this presentation, at least initially, from the first person. Okay. Here's a critical piece of this. If the person says they'll go to treatment, go. Don't care how they go. I was in an intervention. Okay, I was in an, inter I was in an intervention in Northern California. This was actually before I was doing interventions myself. I'm with uh, a gentleman named Ed Storty. He's one of the most renowned interventionists in the world. Okay, he identified what's called the Storty model. It's a motivational model of intervention. A lot of what I'm telling you is directly related to that style of intervention. It's a very effective method. And he had invited me to come and sort of co-facilitate, not even co-facilitate, to watch him intervene. I mean, I was basically training, watching him like a, like a conductor in a symphony, move the pieces of a puzzle to a point of conversion for the afflicted, where they said that they would go to treatment. Okay, so he and I are doing an intervention. I'm sort of, I'm young, I'm 25 years old. I'm looking at the family. I remember my heart was beating out of my chest. I, I was concerned actually that, that, that you could see my heartbeat through my, through my jacket, which I'm not wearing today obviously. But I was so scared, but I was listening and I was mesmerized by his tone, his inflection, his pace. He didn't go up here. He didn't go down there. He did these little spurts and these little drops. I mean, it was like, it was an amazing thing to watch. We do it for about 20 minutes, which is a long time. I mean, I just want you to know you're exhausted by that point. Um, long as an intervention will last hour, hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half, anything over that, it's a disaster. Walk away. I'll tell you how to exit the intervention later. But we're about a, a half hour or so in, and the person... Uh, 20-ish year old female, had been abusing amphetamines, was out of her mind, was uh, an entitled young lady. She had basically gotten everything that she had wanted from the parents. And that's not to point fault. That's just to say there was a dynamic here that suggested she would get her own way whenever. But for, you know, the moon, the sun, the stars aligned, she was uh, tired of using, essentially. And so when we intervened, about a half hour into it, she said, okay, I'll go. And I think it was like a brother or maybe an uncle, somebody to the right of me. So we've got this commitment to go. And I'm telling you, it's a, it's a commitment. She is going to go. Says something to the effect of, oh, I don't want you to go like that. You need to understand what you're doing. Do you understand what you're doing? And I just felt like my heart drop. And I actually felt Ed tense up a little bit. And he tried to rescue it, but she was already angry. Because she had made the commitment to go. She knows she needs treatment. She said, I need treatment. That's the concession. She's not going to say to everyone in the room, I'm so sorry for all the things that I've done to you and work a night step and make amends on the process. She's in her addiction. She's toxic. She saw a ray of light and she grabbed onto it. She said, okay, I'll go to treatment. And then this person shut it down and wanted her to go. And he, just so you know, he didn't do it because he was a mean person. 
and he didn't do it because he intended to interrupt the process. He, he did it because his thinking was she needs to know why she's going in order to make it work. That she, ha she had to fully concede all the damage that had been done in order to go to treatment and make it work. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And so she didn't go to treatment. She actually ended up going to treatment uh, two days later. But between the time that she went to treatment and was intervened on, could have been compressed because uh, we could have gotten it done immediately. In the interim, just so you know, she ended up throwing a window or uh, throwing a chair through a window in their house. I mean, you know, that Mishigas didn't need to happen and we could have gotten her to treatment immediately. So when someone says, I'll go to treatment, stop. Stop, acknowledge it, comm commend it, say how happy you are, say how proud of you are. But don't even go too far on that. A lot of times, if you start giving accolades to the person that's being intervened on, just so you know, they cannot tolerate positive reinforcement at this point. They don't feel good about themselves. It doesn't jive with how they feel on the inside. So say you're proud of them. Keep it simple. Don't talk in great detail about how amazing they are because they don't feel amazing about themselves. And you'll see this. You'll know the line of this. So when you're, you know, sort of, going into they've said that they'll go and you acknowledge that this is a great thing you'll see kind of this inability to contain it when that line gets crossed step back okay so do everything you can to get them to the treatment center if they say that they'll go help them pack don't worry about whether they're going to use drink or act out they will okay um, there's you know some theories that say oh you must abstain starting now between here and there the intervention and enrollment in the center? Boy, I, I would say yes, I agree with you. Um, it would be really nice if the person would stop drinking. It would be really nice if the person would stop using. But what I tell people as a professional is not to greatly alter the pattern of consumption prior to admission. And there's a medical reason for that. I don't want someone, it, let's say you're flying to Los Angeles from New York, I don't want them going into withdrawal on the plane. Um, let's say you've got a two hour drive ahead of you to the program. I don't want them going into withdrawal in the car. So I will usually tell families and I would advise you the same way, you know, don't insist that they alter their pattern of consumption prior to enrollment. So, you know, what you're basically doing is you're acknowledging that they probably will use something before going to the treatment center. And, you know, you don't have to, if they've said that they'll, I'll give you an example. When, when I was doing interventions, and it's been a while, just so you know, I, I intervene maybe at this point once or twice a month. It's just purely to help people out. It's not even for money. But the reality is, is that in the heyday, for me, I was doing you know five to ten interventions a month and sometimes more. And it's exhausting and you don't want to do that. But that being said, the um, reality for me is that once someone said that they would go, what I would usually do, do is I'd regroup with the family. I'd ask them if they needed the person that was going to treatment. I'd ask them if they needed any help, any assistance. Did they need help packing? Um, did we need to go somewhere to help them get their things together? Did they need to make any stops? And, and the reason for that is because I knew what they were going to do. They were going to go to their room or to their house or, you know, wherever and use what they had left um, and pack up for rehab, you know. And so what I would do is I'd just give them the space to sort of generally do that. I wouldn't assign someone to watch them, you know, stare at them and make sure that they did or didn't do something. And I would talk with the families and I would explain to them that there's a strong likelihood that this person is going to do one of two things. They're going to either drink or use or attempt to drink and use on the way or perhaps even try to bring something in. But the facility at the end of the day is going to declare them clean after a search. So I knew that if I could get the person alive to the facility, at that point, the facility was going to hand or take the baton that I was handing them. They're going to search them. They're going to search their belongings. They're all addicts in these facilities, so or recovering addicts. So we know and they know where these things are going to be hidden. And they'll clean them up. They'll get rid of it. They'll clean it up. And at that point, the person is going to go into probably a medical detox. They're going to be given medications. The compulsion is going to go down. So I just wanted no interruptions on the way to treatment. Even if that meant, you know, someone saying, hey, can we stop and get a bottle of vodka? You know, I, I would coach them on 
well, I shouldn't actually say. The truth is, is I've never had anybody drink or use in front of me. Um, and part of that is because of the language that I use and my insistence. So my per I mean, let me, let me back out just for a second. I haven't had anybody drink or use in front of me because I wouldn't tolerate that. For me, as an individual that's in recovery, there needs to be some structure that begins on the way to the facility. And the reason for that is because I don't want them to go into the facility and be shocked that they're going to be searched. You know, I don't want them to go into the, which is every facility or every facility worth its salt. I don't want them to go from their life of indulgence and freedom to the facility and be totally shocked about, you know, being searched and being told, you know, here's what you can and can't do. So what I would do is I would prepare the person for the facility's admission by starting to designate little pieces of structure prior to getting them into the center. Now, I've been doing this a long, long time, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do that, which is why I'm advising you to let them kind of do what they're going to do. Um, I had the ability and have the ability to navigate some of these situations a little more efficiently with a broader goal in mind than you might. What we're trying to do right now is just give you the basic information for how you can do an intervention successfully and put as many of the stacks in your favor as possible. So my advice to you is different than the way that I operate. Um, my advice to you is to sort of let them do what they're going to do when they're on their way to the center. I don't think that that should mean jeopardizing your safety or welfare in any way. So you should not stop by a drug dealer's house. You should not wait for a drug dealer. You should not uh, let them guzzle a fifth of vodka. You can let them have a sip or two if you absolutely are concerned that they're not going to go if they don't get it. But that's the extent of it. Nothing that's going to jeopardize your safety and welfare and nothing that's going to jeopardize their safety and welfare. Um, once they enroll in the center, most important part, easy, quick handoff. You don't want to spend a lot of time at the facility. As soon as they arrive at the facility, there's going to be a little bit of shock. Okay, and there's going to be a little bit of regret. I don't care how nice the facility is. I don't care how beautiful the intake person is. <laughs> okay, I don't care whether the person that does their intake has known them for 10 years. The truth is, is that, which shouldn't happen by the way, but the truth is, is that when you, when you have been intervened on, which I have, okay, and you go to a facility, it's a bit of a shock. And, and it's a shock because You've been living an indulgent life that has no structure and nothing required. You do whatever you want whenever you want to do it. And so as soon as you go to a facility, there's a little bit of a sense that that's going to change. Okay, And you, you definitely, the addict will start to regret a little bit this choice that they've made, which is not unusual. It's normal. It's natural. So what you need to do or you could consider doing is what I advise. Get them to the facility, 15 minutes, pat, pat, you're gone. So you're basically saying, here they are. I love you. Do you need anything? Goodbye. And the reason for that is that, listen, you may think, you might be paying for the treatment. So you're paying for the treatment and you may think you're the customer. If you put yourself in front of the patient's care, you're going to interrupt their treatment. So they're going to have some doubt upon enrolling at the facility. And they're going to have some reg regrets. The longer you linger there, the more likely it is that they're going to bolt. The longer that you linger there, the more likely it is that you're going to have to do another intervention that says, no, you got to stick and stay. you got to be here. It, if you're not there, you're not between the treatment and the client. You're not anywhere in the vicinity. All they can do is maybe call you, um, and that's much different than you being there in person. So you, this one you, you should trust me on. The best way to do an intake, I'd say 15 minutes at the least, 30 minutes at the most. You do not want to be there longer than that. You won't probably want to be there longer than that, truthfully. But, you know, sometimes families want to spend time with clinicians, maybe go into an office, give some background. I actually think you should defer that to the following day. You're emotionally exhausted. It's been a long month. The road getting here could have been years long. 
you need a break. Quite frankly, if you're not an alcoholic, you're going to need a drink. I mean, that's just, these are exhausting processes. You can see we've talked about just basics and we're an hour into this. So, you know, the truth is, is that if you want to do this the most efficient way, when you drop them off at the facility, you should not linger there a very long time. Um, I think I'm going to break there, you know, because the reality is, is that there's some more information and I don't know how I'll post it, but I'll give you another tidbit about once a person enrolls in a treatment center, you know, ultimately how you can best support that process because your goal is to get them there. And that's really all I want you to focus on right now is to get this person into treatment. Um, you know, whereas they don't have a chance without it, they will have a chance with it. And that's what this is really about. But there's, I guess in the next video, what I'll do is I'll give you some information about how to approach the treatment process once it's initiated. So I hope this was helpful and we'll be talking again soon.